are very important to have with our, with our kids. And please remember, really, really important definition of parenting. We said that our job as parents is fourfold. Our job is to protect and prepare our children to thrive and survive in the society that they will live in. And remember that the most crucial part of this definition of parenting is the society that they will live in. The society that, will live, that they will live in determines what I need to protect them from, how do I need to prepare them, what success is, and what does it mean to thrive and survive in that society. And also, you know, by means of observation, the majority of us are immigrants. Nothing wrong about being an immigrant, alhamdulillah. Problem sometimes is that we immigrants make this mistake. Some of us, and, and, I, and I say this is speaking to my brother, so please don't, don't be offended. Sometimes we as immigrants make the mistake, and that is we come and we reside in America, but we still live back home. As they say, you reside in the U.S., but you're still living back home. This is not good. This is a horrific mistake to make. And sometimes when we do that, the tendency is that we use tools that work for us back home, but they may not necessarily work for us in this, in this society. And even if you're not an immigrant, there is what we call nowadays a generational gap. People who grew up in the you know, um, 80s, 90s, it's very different than growing up now. So even that we may all be part of the same culture, but there is a big, huge generational gap that is taking, um, that is taking place. So part of what we need to protect them from, this is all a big, huge topic. And if I were to ask us right now, what do we need to protect our children from? Some people would say, man, I want to make sure that I protect my kids from um, drugs and alcohol. Some people would say, I want to make sure that I protect them from deviancy. I don't want my kids to lose their deen. Some people say, like, I don't want my kids to be involved you know, in sexual activities. I want to protect their deen. I don't want my kids to be obese. I don't want my kids to have what we call this entitlement mentality or attitude. I want to protect my kids so that they're not into materialism. I want to, so we can all have different ideas about what it is that we need to protect our kids from. Some may be specific to certain areas and some can be what we call universal, meaning that doesn't matter where you are, I want to protect my kids from you know, certain elements. So one of the biggest problems that are happening nowadays is how prevalent, accessible, easy to get marijuana is. It used to be, and, and as you know, I, I'm a therapist, and it used to be that I would ask young people when they come to my um, counseling sessions if they smoke marijuana. I don't ask that question anymore. I usually ask, when was the last time you smoked marijuana? And I can tell you almost over 90% boys and girls, usually the idea is, oh, Sheikh, you know, it helps me do one, two, and three, and when was the last time you smoked? And usually it's about three, four days ago. So we're talking about, this is, this is so prevalent. Marijuana so far, I think last time I checked, is legal in about 20 some states. And very soon it will be legal in all of the states. It's just a matter of time, but we're getting there. And what you love about the, the Qur'an, you know, this is one of two verses that we will be looking at. What you've got to love about the Qur'an, like we keep saying, the Qur'an is a very brave book that is read by a lot of cowards. The Qur'an is not afraid to open these topics. The Qur'an is not afraid of bringing up this very blatantly. The Qur'an is not afraid. And then when I ask my brothers and sisters, say, look, do you talk to your kids about these issues? Do you bring them up? Say, say, my kids are too innocent, they're too young, they don't know anything about them. I'm telling you, man, this is, this is a big lie. This is, not, this is not true. Remember we said that our job as parents is to protect and prepare our children. Protect and prepare. 
This is what the Quran does. The Quran right now is protecting and preparing people when you bring up when you bring up these these topics. I asked one of our kids and I said, you know, he was poor poor young man, you know, he was having problems with marijuana and drugs and and uh, so the parents took away his phone, they took away the car and and I was seeing him and I said I said how easy is it to get marijuana? And he said all I need is twenty dollars. He said all I need is twenty dollars. And then he said this, he said if I have a car, five minutes. If I am going to walk, 15 minutes. I said, what do you mean? He said, I know exactly who sells it. All I have to do is knock on the door, hand the money, I'll be given a joint immediately. Like this is how, this is how, this was, by, this was, this was back in Texas where it was not legal. In California, that's not the case. The same building that I was doing my counseling the same building actually was also a dispensary. Like you could walk out and literally just buy and it was legal. You don't need any medicinal, you don't need any medical doctor, none of that. All you have to do is just go there and just, and just buy it. Um, I usually take pictures of big billboards when I'm in California. You know what, marijuana, make the next right, exit here for marijuana, CBD, THC and so what I'm saying is that it's very available. And the more obvious the danger is, that's when we need to talk. That's when we need to bring these things with our kids. So here is, here is one way, okay? Um, and I love the way that the Quran speaks about this verse. They inquire, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْخَمْرِ وَالْمَيْسِرِ They will ask you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa regarding intoxicants and gambling. And it says, say to the people, قُلْ فِيهِمَا إِثْمٌ كَبِيرٌ وَمَنَافِعُ لِلنَّاسِ Say in them, there is great sin, and there are also some benefits to people. However, the sins in them outweigh the benefit that they may, that they may offer. And this is such a brilliant way to talk. The Quran is open to the idea that, you know, some good is in uh, marijuana. And I'll tell you why this is, this is important. So this is, this is one place. Another place is where the Quran speaks very directly to the believers. Believers, you've got to know this. You know, have you heard the, we've all heard the term ideology. You know the term ideology? What does that mean? Because we want to we wanna think our ideology is Islam, our ideology is the Quran. But what, is, what does ideology mean? So ideology is a way by which we determine what facts are important and what behavior is acceptable. That's really what it boils down to. Your ideology determines what facts are important and what kind of behavior is acceptable. Mosquito has six wings. It's a fact. But how, how important is that? So ideology is not just about facts. It's about which facts are important and what behavior is acceptable. So every now and then, when you are reading the Quran, remember, what facts is the Quran giving you? So right here, here is a fact. Believers get to know that intoxicants, games of chance, gambling, um, idolatrous practice, and the divining of the future, this is nothing but the crafty, loathsome work of shaitan. Shun it. Ijtanibu. Shun it. Don't even come close to it. لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ So that you may prosper. So that you may be happy. So the Quran here is stating a, a fact. So remember part of the ideology is there is some good, but there is a great sin. The sin outweighs the good. And here now the Quran says, look, this is nothing but the work of shaitan. Don't, don't, don't get in there. Ijtanibu. Remember what we said? Which facts are important and what behavior is acceptable. How does it begin? Especially with Mirwan. How does it begin? Why do we need to know this? Because remember that the earlier we know, the better we are prepared and the better we prepare our, um, 
our kids. And the earlier we know, the more that we can, um, the more that we can prevent. So check this out. There are usually four stages that these young men and women go through. I remember I had uh, one of my clients, a beautiful brother, 33 years old. He came and I can so vividly remember. He's sitting there and he's just biting on his nails, scratching on his body. And I said, brother, what's going on? He goes, Sheikh, six months ago, Allah blessed me with a son. And I've decided to stop smoking marijuana and, and I just can't function anymore. I said, brother, how long have you been smoking? He said, I started smoking when I was 13 years old. So he's been smoking for 20 years. And now he comes, he goes, I don't want to be smoking. You know what? Now that I have a son and I just, I just, I just can't do it anymore. And he's scratching, he's biting his nails. He goes, anxiety is high. I can't, I can't sleep. And he's going through what we call the withdrawal symptoms. Well, how did it all begin? How did, how did we get here? And usually these are the stages of how it all begins. Initially, it's what we call experimental use. You know, experimental, you know, you, you're just with your friends and then, you know, you want to, um, somebody brought it up. Somebody spoke about it. Uh, somebody said something about it. And somebody had it at school and they said, here, you want to try it? Okay. Any guess as to what is the average age that kids are exposed to marijuana? Somebody take a guess. Like at what age are kids exposed to marijuana? Nine. 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 Seven. Seven. Twenty, mashallah. Who said twenty? Who said twenty? Oh. So who said twenty now? Okay. All right. So remember this. So it actually, the beginning is around um, elementary school. Sorry, middle school. So people say, oh, so I just have to wait to my kids to go into middle school so that I talk to them about it. No, 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 no. We talk to them before they go into middle school. So around fifth, sixth grade, that's when you want to talk to them about, about this. Anyway, so how does it begin? Experimental use. Now, this is also very timely, remember. June, July, August, that is when the number of people experimenting with marijuana actually goes up. Why is that? It's summertime. What does that mean? There is a lot more free time, less supervision, boredom. This is what we call a recipe for disaster. This is an ingredient for trouble for young men and women. You're bored. A lot of time, no supervision or less supervision because mom, dad are working. And now what happens is you want excitement. And that leads to wanting to experiment with things. Usually at this stage, that happens because of the kind of people that our kids are hanging around with. Okay, the peers that you hang around with. Curiosity. Remember this. Curiosity in itself is not a problem. Knowledge, like what we're doing right now, that is not the problem. The problem is what we call curiosity or unfulfilled curiosity, coupled with ignorance, that is where the problem is. Ignorance plus unfulfilled curiosity leads to trouble. That's where the problem is. So what do you do? Enlighten people. What do you do? Educate people. Not everything needs to be experimented. As they say, some people learn from statistics and some people become the statistics. Okay? And very common in Muslim traditions, you know, the idea of Truly a joyous man or woman are those who learn from people's mistakes and then miserable are those who just become the mistakes. So what happens now is we've got curiosity going on. We've got the peers, we've got wanting to experiment and sometimes kids do this because they just really want to defy their parents. I'm going to piss my dad off. My mom, man, I'm just going to show her. And kids would actually do that. They want to piss you off. 
they want to get you mad. When you say, uh, Baba said not to do it, I'm just going to do it. Just because he said not to do it. I'm going to, and we're going to learn how to, you know, how to deal, how to deal with this, inshallah. So now this is the first stage. You experiment with it. By the way, just to let you know, during this stage, a lot of disaster can take place. So one thing that, that I have been seeing, at least with so many of the people that I have met, is something that we called marijuana-induced paranoia. And that, remember, marijuana uh, impacts people differently. Some people say, look, I, I tried it and nothing happened. And some people say, look, I tried it. I don't know what happened from that day. I had a young man who came to me. Allah, I remember him so vividly. He was a student doing very well, smoked marijuana. And then he said, I don't know what happened, but I froze in the car for 10 hours. I could not move. And then he said, after that, he said, I just became so paranoid, so paranoid that one time he was on the plane and he thought that the plane that he was on was going to crash head on on another plane that's coming from the other, from the other side. And remember, this is a Muslim guy. So he said, I am on the plane and I'm just losing my mind. I wanted to scream because I knew that we were going to crash. Now, this is what paranoia does, does to you. So he said, I remember that I had some pills in my bag, Xanax. I said, what did he do? He said, I took 11 of them. He said, I took 11 of them to calm me down. He said, it relaxed me so much that the plane actually landed and they had people to come and get me off the plane because he was just put to complete, complete sleep. Okay. I had a younger brother. Um, just to, to tell you, sometimes we, we, we're disconnected as parents. Sometimes we're not aware of these things. Uh, growing up, subhanAllah, where I grew up, wallahi, I have never seen alcohol, never seen a gun, never seen marijuana, none, none of that stuff. My parents really never needed to talk to me about this because it was non-existent where I grew up. But that cannot be my approach where when we go to the store, it's right there. It's right in front of us. That cannot be my approach. The young man, um, his, his mom calls me like, Wallahi, after midnight, she said, I'm sorry to call you right now, but, but there is something wrong with my son. He's having seizure-like symptoms. And I called 911 and the ambulance came and, and they looked at him and they said, they said, they said ma'am, they said, your son just overdosed on brownies. And she said, but I didn't make any brownies today. And they, they said, you, you, you don't know what brownies are. So nowadays, they, 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 marijuana can be edible. You know, you put them in brownies, you put them in cake. And the kid, he was just eating and he was not feeling anything. So he just kept eating. Because remember, when you smoke it, you know, you start feeling in about five minutes, you start feeling the impact. Well, it's got to be digested. So he just kept eating and eating. He said, I don't feel anything. So once it started getting digested, that's when he started feeling the whole thing and and the the paramedics they said look we don't need to take him to the hospital he's just going to sleep for the next 15 hours and he's going to be up and that's when you get to talk to your son and of course you know then she finds out that he's been hanging around with people and every night before he comes home and he sees them and what have you but this is now what is what is going on it doesn't stop stop at the experimental use now we go to the second stage now that you've experimented it, now you start using, and now all of a sudden you're not just curiosity, now you're becoming a regular usage. Okay? Um, the other day, I had talking to one of my clients, he goes, um, Sheikh, I've been, I've been smoking a lot lately. I usually when people say that, I say, do me a favor. Have you been smoking or smoking? Okay? And he goes, I've been smoking. I said, okay. I said, what are we talking about? He said, no, Sheikh, I just do it like just, you know, I'm, I'm like just social stuff. I said, how often? He said, once a week. I said, that's regular usage. You're no longer experimenting. That's regular usage. What's going on? At this time, what we see happening is that the user, remember, he's no longer or she's no longer experimenting. Now, the user is... Um, missing more school and missing more work that is related to school. 
Not only that, but now they're also worried about losing the source of drugs because now they're almost becoming dependent on it. Not only that, but they're using marijuana or whatever drug it is that they're using to get rid or to fix the negative feelings when they're not on that, on that drug anymore. Please remember, I love the way that the Quran speaks about, about this. Remember the Quran said that in it there are some benefits. And it's also important that we understand why do, why do young people smoke marijuana. But when I say young, I'm talking about up to 60 years old, by the way. Most people would say, it helps me with my anxiety, which is true, by the way. It helps me sleep, which is true. I have a lot of joint pain, back pain, and it helps me, which is true. It helps me with my nausea, which is true. Ask people who are doing chemotherapy, they're doing uh, radiation therapy, people who have HIV, AIDS, and they're taking medication, they get very nauseated and say, like, man, smoking really helps. People with some kind of tremors and nerve issues helps them. The Quran doesn't deny any of this. The Quran says, yes, it has some benefits. But then the Quran says, be aware, the benefits that they offer are overweighed by the negative impact that they have on you. Such as what? See, initially, like we said before, um, marijuana gets rid of the anxiety. The anxiety goes away temporarily. But when it comes back, it comes back with more intensity. Now you have to speak more, either more quantity or more often, because you just don't like how you're feeling when you're not on it. So what happens now is that the anxiety goes away, it comes back, it comes back with more intensity. Now you smoke more, it goes away, it comes back, but it comes back with more intensity, and it just becomes a vicious cycle at that point. At this point, when the person becomes a regular user, they start staying away from families, they start starting away from um, friends. They may even change their friends and hang around with regular users. And now they show more ability, sorry, they show more ability in, in tolerating the, the drug. You know, it used to be it just makes them shake. Um, I remember one time I, I drank Starbucks coffee, like early in the morning. I think they didn't have creamer, it was like black coffee. And I remember I drank that stuff and I started shaking, okay? And then the more you do it, then what happens? Your body just knows how to, to handle it at that, at that point. Well, the same thing goes for marijuana as well. Well, now we are no longer experimenting. The person is no longer a regular user. Now it just becomes a daily preoccupation. That's what they think about all the time. That is just what's in their mind. Now there is no motivation. Uh, they don't care about school. They don't care about work. People just say, I, I know I didn't go to school. I, I, I lost my job. And clear and obvious behavioral change is taking place at this point. Thinking about the drug use, which is more important than everything and anything and anything else. Now, as parents, we've got to be paying attention. You've got to be aware of where our kids are, what is going on with them you know, monitoring their, their behavior, because we want to make sure that we, we pay attention to these, to these things. Person at this point becomes more secretive. They lock in their room. They don't want people to come in. They, 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 you know, they don't want you to see what they're doing. Um, that's actually true. They may start dealing drugs in order to support their habits. And I did have young, good Muslim, you know, brothers and sisters who would do this just to, to support that habit. And now, you know what, marijuana may not even be doing it, and now they need to mix it up with something else. Uh, you know, somebody told me, um, a friend said to me, if you smoke marijuana and take Xanax, that's really, will give you the high. Um, you know, if you drink and you smoke, that will really do it for you. And, and, and unfortunately, at that point, a person may also get into legal problems. Uh, at this point, the person is no longer curious. They're not, you know, regular users. Now they are preoccupied, and now they're fully dependent. This is when a person becomes a, an addict at that point. We've got addiction at hand. So what happens is, at this point, they are not only able to just get high, 
but also now they're no longer able to avoid the withdrawal. And not only that, but they cannot function without it having it daily. I remember I spoke to this young brother and I said, he said, look, if I don't smoke, he said that I just cannot, I cannot function, I cannot sleep. The other day I tried to go to bed, I went to bed by, you know, at 11 o'clock and it was 5 a.m. and I was wide awake. And I just could not function the next day. I said, you know what, screw it. I'm just going to um, smoke again. Physical condition gets worse. And this is when a person really, really becomes very, very dependent. And then we see people maybe breaking ties with their families, with their friends. Financial and legal problems are getting worse. And this is when what we have is um, addiction is, is at hand. Okay. I'm going to skim through this very quickly because there are the important things that I want you to, inshallah, know about. Whenever we speak about um, addiction, this is what we're looking at, the four stages. There is a loss of control, despite the person seeing the negative consequences. There is that craving, a person just constantly wanting to have some of it. There is that compulsion that you, I, I must use, and you do so despite the consequences. You know that the consequences are bad, but you're still doing it. That is when we say that a person is addicted at this at this point. And then what we usually do is that you know we speak about what does it mean to be addicted or dependent. Well, there are two types of dependencies. There is physical dependency, and then there is emotional dependency. Physical dependency is like we said that a person cannot function until and unless they cannot sleep, they cannot eat, they cannot walk because of all the pain that they're going through. So now they become physically dependent. But the worst type of dependency is emotional dependency. Because literally at that point, you become enslaved to whatever it is that you're addicted to. I mean, just imagine. Wow, you know, you feel for the parents. And, and, and I'm sorry if any of us are going through this, but you really feel for the parents who've worked so hard for their kids and, and they just did everything that a responsible parent would do. And then it's like, I don't know what happened, man. My son was doing good. He was destined to be one, two, and three. But then he got with these guys. And nowadays it's just like, I have to pick him up. Um, the other day, a parent is telling me, you know, my kid said that he was going to be home by 8 p.m. I keep calling and calling and calling. And, and I had the tracking on his car and I went to pick him up and and he was just on the verge of collapsing because he was absolutely drunk. And this, this, this father would speak about, look, I did everything for my kids. I put them through Islamic school. I took them here and we went to Hajj and we went to Umrah and I made sure that his friends were always welcome in the house. I was, and then all of a the sudden they just look, I don't know what's going on, man. And, 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 and these parents are just saying, look, I cannot, I just does not seem that he is able to function without this. So emotional dependency is the worst type of dependency. Okay, cruising very quickly. We, we make a distinction between drug misuse, abuse, and, and what have you, and all different types of, um, of drugs. This is, this is really a day-long presentation. Um, but here is, here is what I, I want you to also um, get into it, okay? And then we speak about the, the impacts of marijuana. All right. Who's at risk? Okay, this is the part that's really, really important. I want to know, are my kids at risk? Are members in our community at risk? Because I really want to know. Remember, the whole idea is to prevent. Whenever we speak about factors, we want to look into what are factors that would protect and what are the factors that would place a person to be more at, more at risk. So we're talking about risk factors and protective factors. Risk factors are things or characteristics that when present, a person, their chances increase of doing something. Protective factors are again, characteristics, things when in place, a person's chance of doing something actually decreases and at this point we're talking about what are the risk factors that if present the person is more likely to smoke and what are the risk factors where if present or the protective factors if present the person is less likely to 
to, to use. Whenever we speak about this, remember it's not a single factor approach. It's like we've got to look over all what's going on. So we want to look into their social, psychological, environmental, and other factors. Let me just give you quickly. Social risk factors. And this is, this is where we as parents come in. So what would make my kids more likely do stuff like that? If they're hanging with a peer group or a group of kids that actually use drugs. You know, in Arabic they have a saying, كَثْرَةُ الْمِسَاسِ تُفْقِدُ الْإِحْسَاسِ You know, when you're just exposed to it, you become numb towards it. You just see it all the time, you know, everybody is doing it, ah, yeah, you know, you become, you become numb and desynthesized towards it. Risk factors can also be pressure from peers. You know, kids would be saying, you tried it, or oh, you're a chicken, you're a big chicken, right? And sometimes if we have not taught our kids how to say no, what are the comebacks? Our kids are at risk. So when, whenever we have a conversation, and I'll be talking to my kids, say, well, what happens if somebody offers you something? I say, I don't want it. What if they insist? What if they put pressure on you? What if they start saying, pack, 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 you're a chicken, pack, pack. What do you do at that point? Okay, like, how do you say no? How do you say no that the person actually stops? Okay. Also, another social risk factor is thinking that everybody is doing it. Okay. If you watch TV, everybody is doing it. If you listen to music, everybody is doing it. If you ask your friends, everybody is doing it. At school, in the bathroom, man, everybody is doing it. At school, everybody behind the gym after school, everybody is doing it. You know, when people get together, everybody is doing it. So now when you hear this idea that everybody is doing it, that's actually a risk factor. Because what happens is that you are building what we call social acceptability. And that is a risk factor. Now I tell, I tell our um, youth group, whenever we sit together, uh, you know, I love to tell people like, some quotes are really, really brilliant. So I, it is something that I share with young people. I say, look, Remember this. Remember what we said about what ideology is? Here is one thing. It said, right is right, even if no one is doing it. And wrong is wrong, even if everyone is doing it. It's not a big deal to be right when everybody else is right. It's a big deal to be right when everybody else is wrong. So this idea of defying social acceptability. We don't want to get there. That's why part of what we do as Muslims is this notion of commanding the good and forbidding the evil. Even for the people who are engaged in the evil. Brother Mujahid Fletcher, if you have ever heard about Spanish, Islam in Spanish. Mujahid Fletcher tells the story of how he became a Muslim. He said one time, he said we were drinking. And he said one of the people that was drinking with us was a Muslim. He said it was a Pakistani young man. He was drinking and he was Drinking, he said, man, I shouldn't be doing this, man. And he's drinking, and he said, I shouldn't be doing this. So he said, Mujahid said, what do you mean? He said, man, I'm a Muslim, man. He said, so what? He said, Muslims are not supposed to drink alcohol. He said, are you serious? He said, there is a religion that actually forbids drinking alcohol. Don't mean to generalize, but in the Latino culture, in the European culture, alcohol is just really, really important. It's like part of the culture. People get together and everybody just, you know, drinks. And he said, he said, I was so impressed that there is a religion that actually forbids alcohol. And he said, that's how I became interested in Islam. So now the idea here is that even as he was drinking, what is he telling himself? Man, I shouldn't be doing this. That's brilliant. And that's like, in, in our deen, even if you are engaged in the wrong, don't fool yourself and try to, you know, normalize, legalize that wrong. Even when you're doing it, man, that's, that's, still, that's still wrong. Okay? Excessive free time and boredom, which we spoke about, need to fit in or being rejected by peers. And there is a lot of pressure that young people go through. Allah, I talk to some, especially young girls. You know, if you're a young daughter, is wearing hijab nowadays, and that's a big, huge thing. Wallahi, that is such a big, huge thing. Because the pressure is just on them, left and right. Like literally left and right. 
I was talking to a young girl. She said, she's just bored. She is suicidal. I said, I said, girl, what is, what is going on? And she's young. She said, she said, every time I go to school, I just hate myself more and more. What's going on? I said, the girls there are prettier than I am. They're taller than I am. They're skinnier than I am. I don't even like the color of my skin. I just don't like anything about myself the more I go to school. On top of that, you know what my parents are telling me about how important it is to put the, to put the hijab on. Here is the thing. When we ask of our kids to do this, but we don't give them enough encouragement, enough validation, enough you go girl and all that stuff at home, and when they go to school and everything is just the very opposite of what we're telling them at home, that's a lot of pressure that they're going through. Okay? So what happens is that if they're going through with it, man, we better give them a lot of, we better give them a lot of support. So the last one is not having good coping skills. Like we just said, you know, the pressure. Like how do you deal with pressure? Oh my God. Like have we modeled to them? Like what happens when you're under stress? What happens when you're anxious? What happens when you're feeling that pressure? What do you do? Well, did we look into their mental toolbox and see if we can give them different tools? But that would be, these are some examples of social risk factors. Psychological risk factors, this is about more of the individual, their attitudes and beliefs about drugs. Man, I love what the deen has done to us. Alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep it that way, Ya Rabbil Alameen. You know when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teaches and he tells you, Al-Khamru Ummul Khaba'ith. Intoxicants are the mother of all evil. That's a very strong statement. The Quran tells you, you cannot sell alcohol. You cannot deliver it. You cannot buy it. You cannot serve it. You cannot clean it. You cannot even be in the vicinity where alcohol is consumed. That's very powerful. You know that 67% of the people who die in fires, they die because they were too drunk to escape. Can you believe this? 67% of the people who die in fires, they die because they were too drunk to escape. There was a study about which state has most uh, numbers of suicide per capita. Most domestic violence per capita. Most high school dropouts per capita. Any, anybody knows which state that is? Michelle, who said New York? <laughs> Khaled? Wrong. Huh? It's actually Alaska. Remember, it's per capita. It's not the number of people. It's per capita. And then they found out it's because Alaska, their alcohol consumption is actually 700 times more, 700% more than the average alcohol consumption in the, in the rest of the states. Okay. Most well, people say that it's the weather, you know, it either gets too, um, no night or no day, whatever the case is, but this is what they're, you know, this is what they're um, looking at. So you got Islam and it comes in and just gives you all these kinds of like, you know what, this is the mother of all evil. Uh, personal values. You know, nowadays we have got, uh, man, and I, and I absolutely despise the culture that we're becoming. Our culture is now all about what? Man, let people just do whatever they want, man. No judgment, man. Anybody can do whatever. I, I, man, I hate this statement so much. You know, it, it's all about, you know what, people um, being free to do whatever. I, that is just a bunch of garbage. This is rubbish. Okay? Lack in self-confidence. Yeah. We see kids. Kids who don't really have that self-confidence, they are at a higher risk. Curiosity to use drugs. Remember what we said, curiosity that has never been fulfilled. High stress, depression, anxiety. Don't think that drugs are all that dangerous or lack proper education about it. That would be it. Environmental risk factors. Access to access and availability of drugs. It's there. I can buy it. Crime, violence in your neighborhood. That's a lot of pressure. Community norms. Everybody does it in the, in the community. Chaotic family life. Our house is just not a happy house. Poor adult role models. People in my, adults in my household, they all smoke. Lack in respect for authority and the law. That would all be risk factors as well. Anyways, 
So these would be, would be that. Protective risk factors. These are things that are must-haves. That when, they, 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 when we see kids have these things, they're actually at a better place. People who hang around with a peer group that does not use drugs. See, remember this. As much as I love the masjid and love seeing young people at the masjid, this is not, not, this is not where young people want to hang around all the time. What do they want to do? They want to play ball, man. They want to shoot some. They want to watch some. They want... So it's about the kind of activities that we create. They actually have to make sense. Because remember, we're talking about the society that they live in, not the societies that we came from. Okay? So we've got to create an environment where like-minded families, like-minded kids, they can come and hang around together. Good social coping skills. Anger management skills, stress management skills. These are important. To believe that not everyone is doing it. The people at the masjid don't do it. Or at least we would like to believe that the people at the masjid don't, don't do that. Remember, that's contrary to everybody is doing it. Less unstructured time. There is something to be done. Able to talk to family and adults about dangers of using drugs. They're actually, when you do that, the kids feel better prepared. Confidence, good coping skills, attitudes about drugs, they're dangerous, they're haram, Allah despises them. It's the work of shaitan, high personal values, good stress management skills, strong family relations. This is really, really important. Okay? Sometimes you may have all of these things and still kids make poor choices. But what we're looking at is the more we have of this, the better it is. Strong family relations positive adult role model, community, clear boundaries, community involvement, having respect for authority and the law, kids who are successful at school, having goals and plans to reach them. Um, you know, talking about kids and, and, and success at school. Does anybody know how, um, in, in California, for example, between 1984 and 1994, the state of California built 21 prisons and one university. Okay. Does anybody know how they determine where they need to build prisons? Like what do they look at? Uh, test scores. Like SATs, uh, ACTs. Keep, go keep going, yeah. Uh, also, uh, poverty. Poverty. Poverty, yeah. Keep going. You're getting there. Um, also, the, uh, I would say, uh, in elementary, uh, they do uh, younger, younger testing on their uh, attendance, uh, grades. Excellent. Third grade reading level. Pay attention to this. Third grade reading level. You know, all the SAT is actually late. You know, we're talking about, okay. Third grade leading level, say, look, they look into it and say, if kids cannot read well by third grade, that kid is in trouble. And those of us who, you know, have gone through kids, you know, there is, there is something that happens in the fourth grade. School seems to be easy, like first, second, third grade, like everything is easy. Until when? You get to the fourth grade and then all of a sudden, the math is hard. The English is hard. It's like everything is like, all of a sudden, it's like everything is so hard at that, at that point. So they say that one of the metrics that they used is third grade reading, uh, reading level. Kids who succeed at school say that they are actually at a um, lower risk. Kids who actually have plans and goals, like I want to do this, they're at a lower risk. Kids who have actually succeeded in some other activities, they are actually at a lower risk. Kids who have strong religious convictions are at a lower risk. Dude, a man's haram, man. I don't, I don't touch it. A'udhu billah. It's haram. I don't, I don't do that. That's really beautiful. That's really beautiful when kids are able to, um, to do that. Practicing, resisting skills, like what we said, you know, talk to them and say, you know, what can, what can be done. All right, let's just uh, um, um, cruise through this, okay? Um, this is something that Ibn Qayyim teaches, and we're not, we're not, we're not going to do this um, 
right now. Okay. What can you do? Okay. Maybe this is yeah. What can what can you do as a parent? What do we do? Number one. Be there. You've got to be involved. We cannot be absent parents. I cannot, you know, fully 100% give that responsibility to, to mom or give it to dad. That is not a good, that's not a good strategy. What we want to see is that we want to see everybody involved in this. Good communication. And that's like the most important thing. And when I say good communication, we're not talking about every chance I get, I lecture my kids. That's not communication. Okay? And that's actually very, that is, that is not, that's not a good thing to do. As one kid was asked, they said, what, how would you describe your dad? And he said, big mouth. What would you like to see? And he said, big ears. So good communication is not just about you lecturing every time. No. It's about you having the ability to give and, and talk with your kids. Set a good example. Actions are more persuasive than words. Like we said earlier, how do you deal with stress? How do you deal with anger? How do you deal with pressure? Set rules and enforce them with consequences. If your children fail to follow, to follow them. And inshallah, one day we'll talk more about this. Also very important is monitor our kids' whereabouts. One thing that we parents make a mistake of, and that is we give away our authority. You're not supposed to do that. You don't want your authority to be discredited or devalued, and you don't want to give it away. It is your God-given right to ask your child where they are, where they're going, when they're coming back, who are they hanging around with. That is your right. The problem is, how do you go about getting there? If you're just going to interrogate, uh, people just know. But I want to be, make sure that, you know, I'm open with my kids that they can tell you where they're going, when they're coming back, we have these expectations. That is very important, and that is your right as a parent. Maintain family rituals. And if you don't mind, Wallahi, if you don't mind, if you, can, if you can share with us, like, a family ritual that you have. One thing that we try to do, we try to watch a movie together every 10 days. I like some clean movies, you know. So the thing is, okay, Bob is going to make us pizza and we're going to watch a, a movie together. That's a family ritual to some people. Anybody don't mind sharing? You have a family ritual? Please. I dance with my little children. Mm -mm 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 -mm. <laughs> MashaAllah. That's a really good one. That's a really good one. JazakAllah khair, yeah? That's, that's really beautiful. Dance with my kids. Go fishing. Anybody else? Walk with them in the park. Walk with them in the park? Yes. Yeah. Play with them. And we get. Yeah. Walk in the park. We travel together. Play with them. Travel together. Traveling yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do, please do not undermine any of that stuff. Allah, do not undermine, belittle any of that stuff. This stuff is really, really important. And this stuff is really good. Maintaining family ritual. Incorporating religion and spirituality practices into family life. And it's so nice. Sometimes I am so impressed by some of these brothers, mashallah. They're at the masjid. But when they come to the masjid, their kids are always with them. And that's why it is so crucial that we have got to make our masjid Kids friendly. You know what's like my dream masjid? Can I really tell you what my dream masjid is? Yes. Board members are not here. Let me tell you what my dream masjid would really look like. My dream masjid is going to be bigger than this, inshallah. It will have like basketball hoops all over the place. It will have like soccer goals. It will have like small tricycles inside the masjid. So that, you know what, as we are making our salah, a three-year-old kid is, you know, riding their tricycle between the musallin. People are saying, Ameen, and he's saying, we, 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 you know. To me, that'll be like my dream masjid. That is literally going to be my dream masjid. What's my dream masjid is when the kids can't wait for Maghrib and say, Baba, come on, man, it's time to go for Salah. 
Why do you want to go for salat? Baba come. My friends are going to be there. The tricycles are going to be at the masjid. We get to do this and we get to do that. And See, if you get a big place and you just put the carpet there, you just kill the place. Okay? Don't get me wrong. There is nothing wrong with having a nice masjid. But see, sometimes what happens is that we put so much emphasis on... And, and we, you know, a good masjid nowadays, like a very, very efficient masjid, is probably used for about one hour a day. You know, people usually come for Maghrib, that's about 20 minutes. Isha, about another, Maghrib is not even 20 minutes. 15 minutes for Maghrib, 20 minutes for Isha, 20 minutes for Fajr, and then the other prayers, what happens? How many people show up for Dhuhr, Asr? And then what happens to the rest of the building? You know, when they say that when you have a business, like the amount of money that you put in establishing the business. Now, what are you getting? What are you getting for it? What good is it that I build this very big, huge place? But for Dhuhr and Asr, I only get two people, 15 people for Fajr, 20 people for, you know, Isha. And like, that's it? That's really what I had this place for? So that's what I'm saying is that we've got to think of ways when we want to incorporate religion and all that in our, in our activity, we've got to think, I want to build a masjid not with us in mind. Don't get me wrong. I love you all. Wallahi, I do. But when I build a masjid, I don't want to have you in mind. You know, nowadays, what do they say about the people who come to the masjid? Are mostly what? Men, over 40, and overweight. <laughs> right? I mean, isn't, isn't that the case? So no, so we, we, want, we want to build our masjid with kids in mind. Now that, that would just make it a better place. Last one here, and I'll just finish here. Um, um, dads got to get more engaged, okay? More involvement in the larger community. I'm, I'm not sure if, if you were aware of this, but today, they had the Boy Scouts. Anybody, do you guys know that we have a Boy Scouts here? Like Muslim Boy Scouts? Brother Walid? Okay. I get pictures, man, of what these kids did today. You know that there is going to be a camp at the end of this, at the end of this month? 23rd, 24th, and 25th. There's going to be a camp where these kids are going to go there. I think on the 30th, the last weekend, I think the Boy Scouts are going to be cleaning the masajid. And I think they're starting at MIC. You know, they just want to go around and just clean the masjid. What happens is that do not undermine and belittle these activities for kids. Remember, we can't really say, don't hang around with bad kids. Don't go to these places. What alternatives are you giving me? And that's the beauty of our deed. You know, Islam says alcohol is haram. But guess what? There are many halal options out there can have pork, but there are many halal options out there. You can't be with this woman, but you can get married. So what happens is riba interest is haram, but all other transactions are halal. So now the idea is you can actually have these, these types of, it's all about alternatives, you know, making viable alternatives. So inshallah, this, this, this presentation is not over. But like we said, you know, this is where we are starting. And that is the we must talk topics. And this was just the beginning of them. And inshallah, hopefully we will, uh, we will continue. One last question I had for you is we, we were having a discussion whether Friday night versus Saturday night, which one would be more, um, I guess, easier for people to attend, Saturday or Friday? Saturday. Saturday? Okay. Okay, inshallah. Allah, inshallah. Jazakum Allah khair. Shakar Allah lakum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of our kids and our families, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And may they be the apple and the comfort of our eyes, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Allahu alam wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad. We'll make adhan and iqam, inshallah.